Uh, maybe I do. I do freak out. I mean, you know me. I do know. Fucking here I was just before I got here, like fixing up my my Sir Splendor Speedball, which is like I'm just I'm in, over at Starbucks here, downing espresso, and I've Were got my really? beta blocker. Now I've got my bourbon. So uh, that's quite the concoction. You gotta. You, you just you know you gotta do what you gotta do. After this many times together, you've probably got it pretty dialed. <sighs> well, I was thinking how we've done like four podcasts or five. And now I'm going, fuck, I'm going to be repeating myself. No. I don't think I have that much else to say. Well, that's on me to prep. Good yeah, you're good questions. at that. I know. Uh, this is number five, I think. One of them was with Jamie, wasn't it? Well, then we've done them with Chaz, too. So mm. I think if you count those, we're beyond that. Uh, but this is the third time in this location at this table. That's right. With the same, this is, it's almost become a ritual, or not a ritual, but an annual thing. Man, uh, Mar Manhattan's with Matt, the podcast. This is episode right. four or five. I want to start Cheers. the podcast. Cheers to you, David. Um, and we had, but we had Manhattan's at my house when you came up to Seattle. Correct. Yeah, so it's been more than just that. this. But uh, I feel a little slighted, got to be honest. Slighted because of that? The volume of my drink is the lowest of anybody's. How did that happen? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. <laughs> did you that, sip it before happened, you handed no, it No, that happened you? because, no, I didn't. I, but because I knew that you were going to get your second. Last time you got mm. your second one before I did. And I really want to nurse this one. So it, it wasn't strategic, but when I saw the levels, I made a, I made a, I, it made it, I called it, I called an audible. You're like the person who sets their alarm five minutes before they right. have to wake up so that they can push it and then sleep an extra five minutes thinking that they're tricking themselves. You're having the same volume. You're just doing it at once, trying to make it seem like it's not as much. It'll be, I'll be up there making your second one at some point well and I, we're, it's all going to work out in the end i think we're both going to need pee breaks before the end of this and that's when yeah. that'll happen that's what happens in older Again, age. 63 i'm going to need a pee break before you're done with the intro exactly um eos.surf is your website do you know what eossurf.com is yeah it's a surf shop wow look at you is it it is well funnily it is um pronounced eos all right and it's the first surf and paddleboard shop of its kind in Wisconsin. That's right. So I've learned about that, and it was a huge shock because EOS, it, um, you know, it's it's a nonprofit. I, I, I guess I didn't think anybody. Anyway, I found out about it searching my own website. Up pops this, and it's just I went what, and then immediately you know I panicked, which is just always the default thing for me to do. Is I went into panic mode. Called up the board member on my on my board who's a lawyer and said, Steve, what are we going to do about this? And he put me in touch with a, a trademark person in San Francisco who served. And anyway, you know, weeks and weeks later and a couple hundred bucks, um, I had EOS.surf trademarked. Got it. And I think, I think at some point I got in touch with those guys and like, I didn't want to, you know, and so once I got it trademarked, the, guy, the, the lawyer had said, well, look, if you want to, if you want to lean on these guys, you know, and I said, I don't want to lean on them at all. But I got in touch and said, introduced myself and they were cool and I was cool. And I, the only, re and I haven't thought about it until you just said it just now. That's funny. I remember going into, um, my it's, local, it was confusing. my local, uh, in Seattle, they're called Bartels, but in San Francisco, it was called something else. The local, like the local drugstore to get a prescription or something. This is just when I was starting to do the website. And all I was thinking about was EOS. And I was waiting to get my prescription. And right in front of me uh, on the counter was this EOS lip balm. Mm -hmm. in the shape. Have you seen that? So it's it looks like an egg. Yes, it looks yeah. like an egg. And again, I was just going... Son of a bitch! Like, like I thought, I thought EOS was kind of a cool. Yeah. No, everyone's thought of EOS. There's so. a winery in Paso Robles. Really? EOS. But funnily, the surf shop is in Sheboygan, right on Lake Michigan's shoreline, which I thought was kind of novelty. You know, I wouldn't have even brought it up if they were on the coast. But the fact that I could say Sheboygan for the first time on the podcast, I'm like, let's throw that in. Isn't um, wasn't Chicken Joe from uh, Surf Stop? Didn't wasn't he from Sheboygan? That sounds right. Yeah, you're right. Were you, you were in that, right? I wasn't in Surf's Up, but whenever I get a chance, I I will stand up and cheer as that being, and I, I say this slightly ironically, it's animated, I know, but it's my favorite surf movie. Is it really? I mean, pretty low bar, right? I mean, there's, I don't know what else. I, I happen to be, and I know I'm in a minority, but I happen to be the person who thinks that um, Big no, Wednesday oh. isn't that great. Okay. You know? And... And I, I remember saying Big Wednesday wasn't, like, I remember seeing it in a theater just after I graduated high school in 78, I think. Oh, wow. 
and think, think thinking I was really disappointed. And the other thing that's funny about Big Wednesday is when it came out, Surfer and Surfing, as well as the Times and the New York Times and everyone, everyone ripped it. No one liked Big Wednesday. Okay. And then the VCR comes out, you know, whatever it was, five years later or something, and somebody at, was it Warner Brothers? Somebody at Warner Brothers was smart enough to push that, you know, uh, discount movie out mm. on on VHS tape, and it was kind of it was kind of weird because it was nostal it was a nostalgia movie when it came out in seventy eight. So it's in, it's seventy eight, but it's mostly set in um, the fun part is all set in sixty two or whatever, and then it, you know it comes up to the the big day, yeah, the day like no other. But it still was kind of a nostalgic movie when it came out, and then five years later, it's like double nostalgic because then you're going back to seventy eight plus back to sixty two. And plus, you know, you could either get that or Endless Summer. And I guess first you get Endless Summer. And then once you're done with Endless Summer, you might as well pop in Big Wednesday. Uh, and it just became this cult hit, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everyone loved it. Yeah. Except me. I didn't. I, 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 I remember <laughs> renting it going, I'm going to give this another try. It must be better than I thought it was. And I was just thinking I need to do that. The only thing, I'll, I'll watch anything that Gary Busey's in, you know. I know. Busey's solid. Right. But, I'm a fan. But yeah. Does he actually surf? I don't think so. And somebody pointed out to me recently that uh, as good as he was, uh, who was he? He was, he was Leroy. In Point Break? Or no, 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 in, in, uh, in Big Wednesday. He was Leroy, oh, right? Oh, oh, I don't. Yeah. Dude, I anyway, don't I think he's Leroy. Anyway, the point, the only thing is, is, that, is that his character, the surfer, he wore his trunks too high. He wore his trunks like almost up to his belly button. And, you're, and Jan Michael Vincent looked like a surfer and William Catt mm. looked pretty surfy, you know? But Gary Busey... Still looked like Buddy Holly to me, right? Right, right. I think I think Buddy Holly came out that same oh, that okay. same year. Didn't he win an Oscar for Buddy Holly? Do you know? Is that, that's just no so clue. much before your time. Well, I'm just I'm curious because he was in two iconic surf films, so you would think that he would what surf. Was that, what was the other one? Oh, oh, he was in Point, Point Break. Break. Yeah. Wasn't he a lawyer in Point Break? Or? He was the detective. Detective. Yeah, and he got he got blown away pretty early. No, he was in the whole movie. Which movie was he in? Where he he. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, and honestly, I'm no expert on any surf film, even Surf's Up. I only saw for the first time in this last couple months because of the kid. But um, Point Break, I haven't watched for a very long time. Big Wednesday, I haven't watched since I was a kid, actually. So I should re-up. I should dedicate a weekend and do it. The other thing I've always said is that uh, there's no good surf movies, but we have two good surf characters. And that's uh, Colonel Kilgore, Robert Duvall, and... Um, Apocalypse Now. Have you seen that? I mean, that's love it. Yes. And again, you know, I'd watch. I could watch Robert Duvall read a shopping list, and I'd be stoked. He's yeah. so he's so incredible. And Spicoli. So between those two characters, we have we do really have two. Like those two characters are to me are amazing, and uh, much more. Like I've gone into this sort of at length. These neither one of those are surf movies, but no. those two surf characters to me, Kilgore is just a psycho. A psycho, but he's like obviously he's a psycho. He's napalming the village to go surf but like he's just us but mm -hmm. but amp like almost amplified to a comic to a ridiculous like all the shit that he's ignoring in order to surf is like all the stuff we ignore to go surf it's you're right though those are two characters that are more accurate ref reflection of surfers than are reflected in the actual and, surf and, and films. When you try to draw, do a surf character, exactly, right? They're yeah, terrible, yeah. right? Yeah. So, and then Spicoli, if you were if you were in high school in in um, in a coastal town in California in the seventies, every you know Spicoli was everywhere, right? We are all Spicoli. You want to hear some hot gossip? Uh, Barbarian Days oh. is in the pre pre production planning stages. I just got this info last week. Uh, Matthew McConaughey's involved. Edward Norton would play Bill Finnegan. Is this not news to you? It's just total news to me. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So did you see, um, I know you're not on Instagram that much, but um, there was a clip that Strider posted on his stories last week of a goofy footer on a soft top paddling into a wave at Surf Ranch, getting to his feet and kind of like getting pushed out the back of it because he didn't know how to like you know, fully right. Right. And then John, John takes off and right. starts ripping the way. It was McConaughey. It was McConaughey. Right? right. So right. that day, everybody was there at surf ranch. Was that because they were having like some kind of pre, like some kind of meeting about it? Like, yeah. And what, in John's place. In oh, that I don't is, know. I don't know if John's involved in the film at all. John, John, but, uh, Edward Norton was there. He didn't appear in that Instagram clip, but Edward Norton was there and some other Hollywood hitters were there and producers and stuff. 
and they're in the when I say pre pre production, I mean gathering funds, gathering right, concepts, right, right, all that right. sort of stuff. But that's why they were there from boots on the ground. So I like it. I like the idea of Edward Norton being uh, Bill Finnegan. I think I think I think it's hard to do that because the the point of the the book is the is is not. Let me see how I would say this. It isn't so much the action; it's Bill's own voice mm -hmm. and and the authority he brings to it, and and so it's not so much the descriptions. Some of that that was also amazing, a lot of it, but it's it's Bill talking to us about surf that makes it work. So it's I don't know, you know, it's too open ended to sort of imagine how that might go. I n I never would have thought a documentary on Dorian Paskowitz would be worth anything, and that to me is the so the, the two movies that I love are Surf's Up and, uh, and, uh, Surf -wise. and Surf Wise. So would you not want to see a stab at it, at least, at Barbarian Days? I, of course I'd want to see okay. a stab at it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I trust Edward Norton. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. So I, you know what I, the, I trust all those guys, but I, I, what I, where I don't trust them is when they think, oh, it's Surf. I got to be careful. I got to be cool. I got to be careful. Like, I want them... The way Spicoli and, and the way Robert Duvall and the way um, Sean Penn did, where they weren't they weren't pandering to surf. Like if Edward Norton, which he does, he surfs. He lives in the colony. Right. And the funny story. The reason I know that is because I went up to go uh, meet uh, Takuji mm -hmm. Masuda, and we went and uh, did something first. We just had a coffee or something. He said, hey, you want to surf? And I go, yes, yeah, sounds fun. And, we, and, the, and the, it was fun surf at the colony. And we went down. And I go, how cold's the water? And he goes, uh, I don't know, you know, 63 or 4 or something. I, was, I didn't have a wetsuit. And, and he goes, okay, well, shit, here, you can use one of mine. And it didn't fit. And he goes, okay, hang on. And he just, we just got in his car, and he's driving along. He's looking for someone where I can just... And he goes, hold on, I know what we can do. And we pull into this house, and I go, where are we? This is Ed Norton's house. And I go, is he, are we going to... He goes, he's not here, but you know, Takuji just knows how to get in. And next thing I know, I'm in Edward Norton's garage, and Takuji hands me a suit. And he goes, this should this should fit fine. It was a spring suit. And so, you know, I was out there surfing the colony in Ed Norton's wetsuit. Did you pee in Edward? Norton's Everyone asked me that. No, I didn't. I didn't pee in that wetsuit. And again, as you know, the age that I am, it's pretty miraculous that I didn't. But I, I actually, I think even if I'd had to, I would have literally left the water. And just gone to pee on the beach. First time in my life. Uh, this is not an advertisement, but what wetsuit does Edward Norton use? I can't remember what it was. It was. It wasn't anything. It wasn't Diplomatic anything special. Of you to not. This was. This was seven or eight years ago. Okay. No, I can't remember. Okay, uh, but you're the same size apparently. Yeah, I thought I was bigger than Edward Norton. Maybe I guess I not. Know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. What was Hard the movie? To size what was the movie? What was the first one that made him famous? Where he played uh, the. Wrongly accused murder victim. Primal fear. God. Remember that remember the moment when he drops the mask and he turns to a Richard Gere and he reveals who he is and like It's almost as it's almost Kevin Spacey esque in um under, the usual suspects. Oh. The big reveal at the right, end when he right. starts walking away and his limp goes away. So uh yeah, that was great. I've loved Edward Orton ever since then. Me too. So we'll see. I hope he does well with it. Yeah, I hope. It but comes you know, to you know what I mean? Like they, I think I feel like if they if they surf a little bit, they end up feeling like they've got to do right by surfing somehow. And then and like so it's almost like their their interest in in uh, not damaging surf or whatever it gets in the way of them being an, like. So if he was if he was going to play something he'd never played before, in other words, if Edward Norton surfs, it can almost I almost feel like it can get in the way of him doing what he would do if he was going to be playing, uh, you know, uh, a skier or, or a tennis player. No, I've, I've made that criticism myself in the past. And I think that some of the best, uh, I don't know, surfing content that we have comes from non-surfers. Like when you watch 100-foot wave on HBO, right? it's an outsider looking in. And it's just, I know. it's a fresh take, right? Yep. So or I, Robert Duvall playing a surfer. That's what I'm, yeah, that's the same thing, yeah, you know? Yeah. So I agree with that in sentiment, but... I don't know. I uh, I trust Edward Norton. I don't know. I have high hopes for it. I but bet again, I'm sure Finnegan's so, probably involved too. Well, I think for sure he would right. have to be, right? Yeah. But it's so early days that it could never come to fruition either. They were trying. They were going to make a. They were going to get a thing going on uh, David Renson's uh, Dora book. Who was going to be involved in that? Uh, Leo DiCaprio. No. And that got that was like in Hollywood Wait. Reporter and everything. Yeah. How? But that was ten ago? years ago. So it got shelved. Okay. It got so shelved. It's not happening. Right. Wow, that'd be incredible. 
did you listen to the podcast that your voice is in? You know, um, that's a that's a weird story. <laughs> so what what Lost Hills? Just for listeners who haven't listened, Lost Hills is a. Uh, I think they're in season three, maybe four. Yes. It's a podcast that exists about Malibu. And so sort of epi- Malibu Noir. Yeah. So episode three, or I'm sorry, season three or four is all about Dora. Right. And uh, I forget the reporter's name, but she's a writer. Dana from- Goodyear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And she was great. I love talking to her. She asked great questions and um, she seemed to understand that it's a, you know, I mean, she obviously the whole point of it, she knew that it, was, it was a complicated story and, and she talked to the right people. And uh, I listened to the first two episodes. I don't listen to those kind of podcasts. It's not quite true crime, although it's it's pretty close to true crime with, true. with Dora, right? It's largely true, and yeah. it is crime. Um, but right from the beginning, I knew that she was going to get into the anti-Semitism and, uh, and the racism thing. And, and I'm fine with that with regard to Dora himself. But where I've sort of pushed back a couple times with the Sunday joint with the OS is when, because of Dora and some people like him, because there are surf, there are racists and anti semites in surfing. But I don't think I tend to think that the sport itself, for all of its flaws, um, skews the other way. You know, because our you know the greatest surfers of all time have, have been dark skinned surfers and. Because the Jew, the Jewish surfers that I know, myself included, we were too busy being dicks to we to we, not to each other, you know, to other people. Like you know, it, it just didn't. It's not that it never came up, but it it didn't come up in surfing as much as it would have in the locker room or on the tennis court or somewhere else, you know. So once the lo- once Lost Hells, like I think episode three started, I felt like it was edging into something about you know. If, you know, tune in next time and find out about the sort of his surfing's history with racism and anti-Semitism. And remember Dan Duane's article from three years ago that was about that, that I kind of got into. And then there was another thing that, with this documentary that came out last year and I kind of got into it again. And I didn't want to have to listen to, to that and just think this is not, this is something now I have to sort of address again. And I just didn't, I just, so I just took the chicken, I just took the coward's way out. And even though I'm in the thing and I love listening to my own voice, you know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't, <laughs> Do you? well, I don't know. Once I it's out there, I might as well say, okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't listen. The one thing I'm super stoked about though, yeah. and I, I, I feel like I should listen to the end because of this. I heard in the very final episode, I said to Dana Goodyear, if you're going to talk about Malibu in the 50s, you need to call uh, this woman, Vicki Flaxman, who lives in Idaho. Vicki's now, I think, 91. <clears throat> and she's probably playing pickleball as we speak. She's, she's just a force of nature. But she was one of those pre-Gidget surfers on the beach at Malibu when Joe Quigg and Tommy Zahn um, and Kip, Matt Kivlin were making those first boards that turned basically you know they went from planks to making boards and, and they're called the girl boards because these you know these 16 year old little high school co-eds were coming to malibu to look at all the cute surfer boys i think that's what vicky told me anyway and next thing they knew they were being they were friends friends with them all in fact claire cassidy got knocked up and got married to joe quig like right away but those guys were making these girls boards that were i don't know a foot shorter and and 15 pounds lighter and off and there's there's girls on the beach with these new boards learning how to surf and here comes les williams and matt kivlin saying hey can i i want to borrow your board you know they you just want to always try whatever's new and they and those guys paddle out you probably know the story they paddle out on these girl boards and suddenly they're doing cutbacks fascinating and And then they wouldn't give the boards back right so at one point you know one of them Daryl and Zanuck, I think, had to break into some dude's house to get her, you know, get her board back because he wasn't going to give it back to her. Wow. Anyway, Vicky's still alive. She knew Dora when he was just sort of coming up, and uh, she's so fun to talk with. And I said, hey, Dana, look, you know, if you're going to do this whole thing on Dora in the 50s, and if you're going to talk about Malibu surfing in this period, this was before I was born, you know, just call Vicky. She's wonderful. And she did. And... I, I, Vicky told me that she had a great conversation with Dana, and I should I should listen just to tell tell Vicky I heard it. So I you know Lost Hells get to the end, and I think you get a nice bonus bit with Vicky Flaxman, who's incredible. Uh, well, I will say to your point 
about the anti-Semitism thing. I got an email from a listener that was really well worded and I, I'll botch it now. I wish I could pull it up and just read it to you, but he was basically <laughs> saying something very similar to you. Um, I've got bottles of water if you need just no, shout good. out when you do. No. Uh, also for listeners, if you hear clanking, got lots of meat and cheese yeah. in front of us. Smoked meats. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and what, do, what is this right here? So those are oh, those peppers. They're sweet, spicy peppers with cream cheese inside. I'm so glad I didn't put that in my Manhattan. I thought it was a, uh, I thought <laughs> no. it was a, 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 cher- a maraschino cherry. You know what? It Who knows? Been. Yeah, it could be awesome. I'll right. try it when you leave. Right, okay. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> They're delicious outside of the Manhattan. But um, anyways, if you hear clanking, that's what that is. Uh, as, re- as it relates to the podcast and the anti-Semitism thing, a listener wrote in, beautiful email, calling out Dana on that exact thing and basically saying, look, Dana, You've been in Malibu for 10 years now. Right. Like, I know that seems like a long time. Right. Turns out it's not. Right. But you're misunderstanding something, which is surfing is highly prejudiced. Very little of that prejudice, almost the smallest percentage is racial. If you hold your board wrong, we're going to call you out. Mm-hmm. If you wear your... The wrong that, color, you know, a colorful that, no, wetsuit. That's we're what I'm saying. We're, we're like, too busy being dicks about everything we're, else. We're super duper prejudiced. Right. You got that right. Right, right. It's almost zero of it is racist. Here's the thing. Here's where it gets really tricky. And I can't believe I'm stepping into this because it's so fucking fraught right now. But people like Dana or people like anyone who's sort of looking at this, especially in 2023. So the first thing to say is that the things that we're looking at today are going to register different than they would have even 10 years ago. But especially, so if you're looking now at a, uh, a swastika model surfboard, or if you're looking at Dora or one of his pals, uh, Dora's a bad example because he probably <laughs> really wasn't at it. But if you're and, looking and at- And that's what the listener said too. So, He's so like, it's Dora not, is right. Race. So, so, got it's, so you got yeah. so you got to make all. The, but if you're looking at somebody like okay, the Greg Knoll, because Greg Knoll admittedly said, you know, we used to paint a swastika on, on the car because it pissed people off, and right. if it pissed them off enough, we paint two swastikas. So, you have these kids that are doing shit back then that was stupid and was offensive, but it wasn't them trying to even pretending to be, uh, you know. Uh, not to, you know, be, be pro-German to you know be, to be anti-Semitism. They were just doing what they knew would upset people. Right. Don't use this part on the whatever the like, just. <laughs> I don't want that to be the thing I'm trying to say because what I've come to realize is that is that to to defend those kids. Let's just say so. There's a, there's a famous picture of this uh, of this sort of woody looking car driving down PCH, and there's all these blonde haired kids. And a couple of them are doing like uh, Heil Hitler signs, right? And one of them is Bob Fiegel or Feigl. I always forget how to say his name. He used to work at Surf Guide magazine in the 60s. He's probably about 80 years old now. And I got him to, I got Bob to write about that picture. That picture appeared in Life magazine. Did it? And um, it did. It appeared in Life magazine in an article about. It's like maybe maybe 63. It was just an article about surfers. And look at the crazy surfers. And so it, in 63, you can run a picture of these surfers doing this because, you know, that's sort of like Hogan's Heroes. And everyone's just sort of like the, it, wasn't as, it wasn't as freighted actually then as it is now. Because in 63, the Nazis were over. Like it, they were defeated, vanquished, done. Right. And now it's all kind of coming back, you know. So again, it doesn't. But the, if you, you have to put it in the context with which, it, and, and, and Bob said, look, uh, everyone thought I was Jewish. My last name is Feigl, Feigl, you know. He goes, it turns out I'm not, but I always was thought of as the Jewish kid. It, didn't, it had nothing to do with my life. But he said, the photographer was telling us to drive up and down PCH. And at one point as we were driving, I, you know, how you, there was sort of open air. This, this this thing they were in was sort of like a like a like a modified, really old milk truck with like an open top and and he and so Bob's sitting uh, on the uh, in the shotgun seat or something and he just got his hand out the way you do you know you put your hand out and you kind of surf the the current you surf the current and they're driving back and the guy said oh do that do that thing again when you do the Hitler sign and Bob said sure he was fifteen so they come back again and he just throws up. He just throws up the Hitler sign because the photographer asked him to, you know. So here's this guy who everyone thought was Jewish 
doing the Heil Hitler and it's in Life magazine. So A, it's not him trying to do anything. Um, he's just being a 15-year-old punk-ass kid. If For them, I think the, the radical part was that they've got six kids in a, in a funky old car and they're tearing ass down PCH with the wind in their hair. That's the, that's the part that's... Aryan kids. Yes, I know. Coincidentally. Um, slight, that, that's slightly tangential, but, but yes, it looks... Yeah, right. For the optics is all I'm saying. Right. Uh, and that's the other thing is it's not... It'd be one thing to say like, in perpetuity now from that moment on, it looks that way. But to be honest, it's not in perpetuity. It's in this moment in time, it looks that way. I hope that in the future, people do account for context. They don't. They I, don't. So now. here I am, here I am trying to, I, I'm making this defense of this right now. And I guarantee you, someone's going to listen to this and go, fucking, there goes Warshaw again, you know, apologizing for all this stuff. And yeah, but that the, person, I, again, I don't think that is going to be the norm for the rest of mankind. I think that that's a moment in time that we're living in now where they don't account for the nuance and the context. I don't think people account for nuance and context. I don't think they do. I think they you know, don't. But I, in the future, I hope that they do. Yeah, I have I, hope I, that. I you, have your, hope. your hopes for the future are more optimistic, I think, than mine are. You know, I'm not. <laughs> you might anyway, know more it, than I do. It, it, um, it, it, uh, yeah. So, uh, anyway, I, I, you know, I, I really, I really vowed after I the last Sunday joint I did, where I, this kid did a documentary a few months ago called Tora 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 that was all about, you know, he was a new, surfing newcomer, and you know the story, and he had a, he had his bar mitzvah, he had his bar mitzvah at surfers uh, at Shack at Surfing Heritage Culture Center, and in the middle of the bar mitzvah, someone notices there's a swast a swastika on a board, and it's one of those Pacific Home Systems swastika models from the 20s or the early 30s, right, which pre Hitler, you know, and and anyway, he this kid goes to UCLA Film School and he uses th this thing about his bar mitzvah to like say I'm gonna you know now I'm gonna uncover the you know, surfing secret Nazi past. Sort of oh thing. yeah yeah yeah. So you know I got all I got I got all upset about it again and did the same thing I did with Dan Dwayne's thing three years ago and I just said fuck I'm, I can't do this anymore. I said I've yeah. said my bit on it and here I've just said it again and um, I'm again I'm not saying there aren't racists or anti semites in surf. There are, but I don't think surfing surfing doesn't skew that way. I think it skews actually slightly the opposite. And there's so many other things that we can get on surfing's case for legitimately, but yeah, no, and it skews more progressive I, across the board. Go ahead. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I used to think that too. Oh, I don't okay. know. It's it's gotten so. I mean, it's I don't know. Let's let's move on from the politics. <laughs> I, I I used to think it's I, not even politics to be honest. It's just I mean it's. It's cultural more than it is anything, and it's um, you're a historian. It's correcting the narrative on the culture with these newcomers. Again, Jane and New Year, whoever it is, yeah. come in, and uh, if they run with the narrative, that becomes the norm. And the reality is, they're right. incorrect. Like right. my listener pointed out, right. Dana, you've only been in ten years, and by the way, you've only been in Malibu. Like, there's a whole world of surfing that exists well right. outside of Malibu, and Malibu is kind of the uh, I don't know. It's it's a totally different example. It's such a unique example because of right. where it's positioned. In the, so you got it all wrong. Like And again, surfing's fraught with peril, as you pointed out, for a bunch of reasons that are worth discussing. Right. And it is highly prejudiced for right. a bunch. Right. But the race racial component is the smallest. The racial of component it. to me is just so strange that people sort of bring that up and I don't, and I always get a little squishy between the racial and the anti-semitic stuff it's just all it's it's sort of prejudice but it's definitely different but the racial thing is really strange to me because the guy who we everyone right. in the surf world sort of looks up to is the you know the figurehead of the whole sport is Duke Hanamoka who was kicked out of hotels across America for being black you know how many of our you know, Rushmore level figures in surf are dark skinned surfers. You know, we all, that was, you know, the dark skinned surfers were the, were the, the, the ones that we all looked up to. Totally. The heroes. And again, it doesn't mean there isn't racism, but it just means that our way of thinking, you know, we, we were, we, we sort of got started. There was sort of this head start where, um, you know, the dark skinned surfer comes out in the water and you're impressed, not, Who's this guy? Right, 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 right. Well, 
Again, it doesn't mitigate it racism. Doesn't. No, it, it doesn't. It just, racism just, exists. It, in just, the, it just puts it on a slightly, I think it just tilts it a little bit. Like that's because that's what our experience is. Racism absolutely exists in all aspects of the world and in almost all cultures, I'm sure. And it exists in surfing as well. But in the way that it's framed by the people that we just talked about, it seems to be incorrect. I think what they want to do, and I, I, I don't know, I think what they want to do is they've got to, they've got to, they're going to tell the story that, that hasn't been told. They think they, they think they've yeah, got the secret yeah. to it. I'm just going, come on, man. Yeah, it's not worth it's not worth the headline. It's not worth the click, whatever. Um, you know, and you want to talk about surfing not being great to women. I'm here for that conversation. I'll yeah. ba- I'll back you on that all day long. That's just factually, ethically, morally, provably true all the way through. Yeah. The racism thing isn't for me. Um, Next. <laughs> you know who reached out to me because of our last conversation? Who's that? Felipe Pomar. Oh, Felipe Pomar. Shit. Um, Are we going to get into the whole... He, he, I gotta, did he reach out to you too? No, I've got such a long, weird history oh, with Felipe. You? Yeah, he... he, he uh, what a nice guy! What a what a wonderful he, you know he 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 called me up when I was writing the history of surfing, and so this was I'm going to say like 2002 or three, no 2004 maybe. And have you ever have you talked to him much on the phone and stuff? He's so nice, so polite. I did a couple Such of podcasts gentleman. with him, and so we talked yeah, for yeah. a couple of weeks straight, but then not since. And uh, you know almost speaks sort of formally and, he, and it's always mm-hmm. very you know, incredibly polite because he's very upper crust. You know, he's very, that whole Peruvian scene is really strange because it's, it was just for a long time anyway, it was just all these people who were like these gentlemen surfers and out of those gentlemen surfers, a few of them were really hardcore. Felipe was maybe the most became great surfers, but a lot of them were this, these sort of, you know, dilettantes and they were industrialists and, and club Waikiki was just filled with, you know, high-ranking political people and high-ranking business people and all that kind of thing. And the government, you know, because Felipe Pomar won that world title in 65, you know, that was a big part. The government was always really behind surfing as a thing because it was a rich person's thing. It was so on, like, the, the history there is so interesting because there it started, the Club Waikiki was founded by a wealthy person with a lot of money, and right from the jump, all the people who surfed were people who were paying big, steep dues to be in this exclusive club that people were going to come to to have lunch and meet, do business deals, go for a surf, come back, hang out by the pool, get drunk, you know. Like golf here. Absolutely like golf. That's yeah. exactly right. So there's there's a lot behind, like they, so, so and you know, and it's great. They, ha, they that's how, you know, Peru for the second world contest, how is 1965, that seems, how random does that seem when you think about the history of surfing in the 60s? You kind of get, okay, well, we'll have the first one in Manly because Bob Evans was a force of nature, but how is the second world contest not in, in L.A. Or, 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 or the North Shore or something like Peru's, you know, that's because Peru was just dead set on getting, and I don't know what went into exactly getting, you know, the, the 65 world, con- world titles in place, but the government was definitely behind it. And you, know, you can see pictures of all of the con- contestants flying in, suit and ties, meeting the, um, the prime minister or the president or whatever. And, you know, Felipe Pomar wins the title. And he deserved it. It was a, it was a weird contest, big giant waves, kind of whoever get the most waves and ride them the furthest. But he won fair and square. So great, good for him. He's, uh, you know, one of my favorite sort of figures in surf history. But he's been on this mission for so long to kind of further elevate Peru's place in surf history. And the thing that he got in his head, one of the things he got in his head, apart from the whole thing with the Cabalitos, you know, yep. that, which... Surfing originated in Peru. Yeah, well, that's, you know, you can, I, I don't call the people, I don't call fishermen riding in on their boats surfing, but, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato, right? Felipe, if you want to think that, whatever. I was the one who ran his article in 88 at Surfer about, you know, the Cabalito being the first, or at least arguably the first surfer. I don't sort of believe it now. I think surfing means you have to go out there to surf, not to fish and then ride a wave in. But again, gentlemen can disagree. But what he got into his head was that the 64 world titles didn't count. The 65 ones were the, should be thought of as the first world titles. 
And there have been, you know, this other guy he's works with on this, I can't think of his name. There's a website on Facebook about it, you know, wrote a whole dissertation on it or something or a whole small book on it. And it just drives me nuts that they are trying to do that. And I, and at one point I got kind of angry with Felipe and I was saying, look, you, you, you call up Midget's family. You tell him he's not the world champ. You know, you call up Phyllis O'Donnell, tell her she's not the world champ, you know, I don't care that, you know, and all these different little arguments they have about why 64 doesn't qualify and 65 does qualify. I don't, I don't want to hear any of that, man. Like the first Pipeline Masters, it was like five dudes and some bunting on the beach with Fred Hemings with the fucking bullhorn. It was like nothing, you know. Here's, and you, know, you Jeff Hackman, you won. Here, come over here, here. Here's your check and here's your trophy and everyone goes off. And it was like, and that's the first Pipeline Masters, you know. And the first world championships was on the beach at Manly. Then Bob Evans did it and Midget Ferrelli won it. And, you know, and well, to not acknowledge it would be to whitewash the history. If you want to say that the 65 was the first world championships that were done under the auspices of the, uh, I think it was called the ISA back then, whatever it was called. Great. Okay. Yeah, well, let's that say that. And that, yeah. and it was like, it yeah. was, you know, but you know, there's the things back there where Peruvians themselves are saying, here we are at the second world titles in 1965. So anyway, so I do love Felipe, but he is relentless. And so when I was in, when he flew me to Peru in whatever that was, 2004, um, every day we'd go out, we'd go surf, and then we'd go out to have some ceviche. He was such a good host. And... And at some point, he, and every day he'd start talking about, he, you know, his whole, the whole reason I was there was for him to convince the guy who was writing the history of surfing to sort of improve Peru's, that, you know, that, it was a junket, basically, right? And I knew that, and I wasn't, and I was appreciative that I got the free trip, but I wasn't, and I wanted to listen to what he had to say, and we went to a maritime museum, and I went to visit this guy, and it was a good fact-finding thing for me to, to do. But he just kept going on and on and on about Peruvians being the first surfers and Peru being the you know the first world titles. And I would just say, hey, Felipe, we just need to change the subject. And he would he'd go, I understand. Of course. Of course we do. And then 10 minutes would go by and he'd go, but, but Matt, l listen, let me, let me. And he would just start back up in again, you know. And he wasn't angry about it, but he just wouldn't let it go. I like him even more now that you've told this story. Yeah. So <laughs> Well, I mean, this is what I love about surfing. It, what a character. What a character. You know what I mean? And when you look back Did at- Did tell you the tidal wave story? Yeah. We yeah. talked about that. Uh, yeah. Tsunami. Yeah. That's, the, that's what I meant. So when you look back at photos of him, I mean, the guy was hulking. You know, like- Oh my God. Like, yeah. not, I shouldn't say hulking. Shredded. shredded. But, but did you ever shredded. see a picture of him standing next to a guy named Hector Velarde? I don't know. Okay. So Felipe Pomar is indeed, and his prime was just ripped. Next to Hector, this guy Hector Velarde, it was just, you didn't even look, you couldn't even see. It, 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 was, it looked just like Felipe, but he was four inches taller, had a bigger, brighter smile, and everything about him was more V-shaped and just more cut. And you're just going, who is that guy? You can't even. Was I'll, he a I'll, surfer? Absolutely. Uh, he was okay. like a national champ. He oh, was incredible. Okay. okay. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, but, but Felipe, you know, what Felipe did that was remarkable was he moved to, the, he moved to Hawaii like in, I mean, I think when he won his world title in 65, he'd already moved to Hawaii. So he, he really committed. Yeah. Like, you know, he, he was going to go ride big waves. And what, it's really funny because, you know, Felipe is now, is, he, he's known for riding the title wave. He's known for winning the world title. But his claim to fame, or one of them, ought to be really high up there. Is that for a few years there, he was maybe the best, you know, or among the best big wave riders in the world. He, he, was, he, was, he was fearless. He was stylish. He was... He was really good, and he brought that to bear. In '65 was big enough that it kind of helped him right, there, but right, right. but where he where he really stood out was absolute maximum level sunset and is YMA as big as it would get. Felipe was out there every time, uh, and just 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 you know dropping in, turning, and killing it. You know, yeah. He talked about sunset. He talked about not. Uh, commit like never drinking alcohol like right, he realized because that's right in detriment to his ambition to well, he's, do exactly that exactly he's hugely yeah. amb you know, the ambition on that guy he wants to surf to 100 now well so that's why he reached out um <laughs> i'm gonna get distracted real quick but if you google matt warshaw i learned today uh <laughs> he do you know what do you want to know what your profession is 
Is this on AI kind of thing? Some kind of, I mean, no, no, this no. This is just Google, Google, Matt Warshaw, and it pops up like a photo of you, your name, the day, you know, your birthday. Well, I hope it, if, 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 if all of my, if all of all my efforts have been, you know, are going to come to fruition, it should say gigolo there, right? <laughs> you wish. <laughs> The reviews, I haven't seen the reviews on that work yet, but uh, I'm curious too. No, former writer. Former writer? Former writer. Like I'm writing for for, for Dane Reynolds' company? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think Google's that smart. It's pretty smart. It's not that smart. Uh, Apparently, you used to write. That's your profession. Uh But then there's a couple of photos, and then the video that it pops up on YouTube. Oh, is the the wave pool thing? No. It's your and my conversation from last time. Oh, no way. Video and it's, but the title of the video is, when is it time to give up surfing? Because that was part of the conversation that you had. So, so Felipe watched that video. Right, right. Like YouTube fed it to him. And he emailed me. And he goes, hey, I watched your video with Warshaw. Fascinating. I enjoyed your guys' conversation. But I have a totally different take. I'm planning to surf to 100. And I would love to share this information with you if you want. Let me, let me just... <laughs> Let me jump in here. So somebody on Facebook like a week ago said, quoted me. Uh, they quoted me about this decision I made to stop surfing. And, he, and, he, and this guy said, hey, I have a lot of respect for Matt Warshaw, but I will never quit surfing. I will never do what he did, da, da, da. And, it, and I just want to say it really got lost in Derek and Charlie decided to when Derek and Charlie decided to name what I would sort of done there, Quitlet, because I wrote about that I didn't want to surf anymore, and then I think J.P. Curry might have written about it, and some other people started. Everyone kind of jumped in and said, yeah, you know, I don't want. I never quit surfing. I quit surfing every day, yeah. you know. So when I moved up to Seattle, when Teddy was two and I was 51, that was my off-ramp. I didn't, and it, and it was the right thing to do, and I will defend it. I've surfed since then. I've surfed, I mean, I surf. And so, oh, I wasn't going to talk about this. I'll get into this. So, so last, so where does surfing fit then? So I've said, I've made a lot, I've, I've made a lot of, I've spoke often about saying what I really want to do these days mostly is body surf because I just, it's easy. It's, you know, but last time I was down here with you, we jumped in the water and I had a great time. You know, if the, if the, if the waves are right, I can borrow a board and get a wetsuit. I had a ball surfing. Where were we out at Bolsa Chica or something like that? You know, something like that. Which might have been the last time I surfed. I'm not sure, but I've never, you know, I never quit. It's always in the back of my mind. I think about surfing all the time. I connect to surfing all the time from the work I do. And then late last year, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer, and uh, so to jump ahead, everything. So I. I got the diagnosis and they said, well, come in in a month and we'll go in and have a look and see what we can. And they take out a small tumor. They decided they didn't have to do chemo, which was a huge relief. And they said, we just have to check you out every three months. And for bladder cancer, that involves exactly what you think it's going to involve. <laughs> Fucking, you know, every three months I'm in there just going, all right, doc, here we go again. And you know. Every three months in perpetuity? Every three months for two years, okay. and then they go at every six months. Okay. So anyway, I've done it four times since, and it's all been clear. And um, it's hor- It's it's as bad as you think. But on the other hand, what a miracle that they can do that and just say, you yeah. know, they don't have to. You don't have to wait for anything to show. They just go in there and have a look. It's three minutes, and you're just gripping. You know, you're gripping the sides of the thing, and. <laughs> And the, the doctor says this thing that's so hilarious. He, and he's so cool, this doctor I have. He just goes, this is so much easier if you can just relax. And, I, and I've actually said, last time I said, Doc, does anybody, do, you, do, you have, do you do this to anybody who can relax? And he said, I know, it's hard. Like he didn't, he didn't even pretend to say that you can relax when someone's putting a camera up your urethra. You, right. It's, you know, so I just start deep breathing like I'm going to have a baby, you know. And he's going, do you want to look on the screen? And I go, no, it's okay. Just, you know, do your thing. And he's, he's polite. It's fine. And, and it's over quickly. And they can tell right away. And he says, you're good. Okay. And I walk out every time, again, four times. So grateful that I live in 2023 when, the, when medicine can just go up there every three months and give you a, yeah. so off you go. Yeah. But for a few days there, you know, before they went in and got the tumor, and they didn't know. And at that point, they thought it was going to be a chemo thing, you know. I'm just going through all the shit, you know, like, fuck. You know, everything's been 
it's all been, and I've, I remember before this happened, I would you know, said to Jody, hey, if anything ever happened to me, you know, I, uh, there's no box unchecked at this point. I, okay. you know, got married, had Teddy, my mom, my, you know, my mom got to see her grandson. My, all my work stuff has been great. I surf all the ways I'd ever want to surf. I've got a million, all these friends. So if I, you know, if I ever, if I ever cross McGraw Street without looking and get hit and it's done, no regrets. I'm, you know, but you know, when they tell you you've got cancer, it, it does change things a little bit, right? And so I had a few weeks there where I was having to walk around and think about that and think, do I really mean that I, you know, I'm okay with it? No, not really. I really want to go as long as I can. They go in, they get the tumor. I've got an all clear. And they said, we don't need to do the chemo. And I'm just sort of walking around. Literally, you, you, know, you want to talk about like, like, a nap, like how to feel good for days in a row is to them, you know, to somebody say, look, you're, can't, you're, you're okay. Your cancer's gone. We got it all. It wasn't deep. You're good. And, and to know that, furthermore, that every three months they're going to check. So it's like, I feel like now, nothing's, you know, right now I'm on alert. Where before, you know, before you get diagnosed, you're kind of, you know, you, know, you, you do what most people do. Like you ignore it long enough. And then it, so now I'm on alert. But I'm walking around just feeling uh, sort of like I've got a second lease. I'm so happy. I hope I live, I hope I live as long as Felipe Pomar. And what came back to me in this, I, I suppose looking back, totally expected, was how much I wanted to go surf. Wow. You know? And so I'm going to bring in a second thread of this story, which is um, I've had a best friend named Mark Theodore since, since uh, high school sophomore. We had a biology class together. And, and Mark and I uh, have been friends and, and we're college roommates and we've... Uh, We've been surfing together since, yeah, since 75. You know, the first surf trip, when I got my license, I ever went, I took Mark somewhere and, um, yeah, we just, you know, ride or die with Mark. And, and when his parents died, and I was really close to his family too, um, when his parents died about eight years ago, one after the other, his mom and dad, he said, hey, uh, my mom and dad, were, I know they'd be super stoked if I took you on a trip somewhere. We should go surfing. We hadn't, we hadn't gone surfing together for a while. Gosh, that sounds great. And I was living in Seattle at that point. And, you know, every time he'd bring it up, I would find some reason to not go. And Mark, by the way, it was a was a like a Tom Curran level NSSA surfer, like Chris Frohoff, Tom Curran, Mark Theodore. Those are the three guys you didn't want to get in the heat in whatever year that was, probably nineteen eighty or something or seventy nine. Really good surfer and still is, never never let up. And, you know, he and I were sort of kind of at a level for a while and I moved away and he's just still really good. And I'm walking around Seattle, you know, cancer free. And uh, after an, after enough times where Mark had said, let's go on a surf trip of me saying, no, he stopped asking me. Like, in fact, you know, after he did that for like two or three years. So I just picked the phone out of my pocket. I said, Hey Mark, um, I'm calling in my marker. Is it okay? You know, we'll, we'll, and he said, of course. Yeah. Where do you want to go? And so I said, well, I, wanted, I really want to go to Nomotu because I'd, I'd thought about it. And I'd looked into it a little bit. And I don't, I mean, like I hadn't spent, I, I just literally like that morning thought, I really want to surf. Maybe I can get marked. Maybe I can call in that mark with Mark. And I just looked up, where can I go? And I realized that if I go to Nomotu, then I can just go surf whatever that beginner's break is out front. I think it's called swimming pools or something, you know, where all with all the other oldsters. And Mark can go to Cloud Break, which is so, so, you know, so super close. I go, let's go to Nomotu, man. And he said, done. And so we booked it on it. So I'm going in two weeks. Amazing. I know. I'm so. You've never been to Fiji? Uh, I've never been to Fiji. Okay. So the question then is related. I mean, in contrast to our last conversation the a year ago about not surfing, how do you plan for it? What boards do you bring? All that. So again, it's it's so it's so weird. Again, it's it's there's it's this gray area between being a surfer the way I was and being you know am I still still a surfer according to like these guys who were kind of making not making fun of me on Facebook a couple weeks ago but who were saying oh he's a quitter he's a quitter so so I sold my boards years ago but Mark Mark lives in Manhattan Beach and he's got so when I say I sold my boards that sounds like oh what a I just I just lit it all on fire I didn't light it all on fire I've got a wetsuit in Manhattan Beach. And I've got all the I've got a whole garage full of boards of marks that I can use. 
and I always use the same one. He's got a seven two that I just like a, tri- like a triple step up that I love riding in two foot ways. And you know, if I'm in town and the water's warm and and Mark wants to surf, I just I, I go surf and it's great. Or w- when I came down to surf with you, you yeah. know. But what do you bring to? I don't have any boards. Mark's bringing three. I take whatever board he doesn't oh, use. Okay. I don't even have to fucking pack See, a board. I mean, that's lovely. I love the idea of that traveling without a board bag. However, given that this is the biggest trip of your life, arguably, mm-hmm. I would have mapped out my boards six months ago. I would have called again, shapers, got them dialed in. You, so, so when I talk to people like you, you there's so few people who have gone like. I, I don't ever want to have to do that again. Okay. Like I had 40 years of that. And what people don't get, like all these people who say, oh, I would never quit. They're mostly people who had to, after high school, like everybody else, go to college, get a job, had a family, da, da, da. I didn't do any of that. I just surfed. I just surfed until Teddy was born, you know? And then was, I, it was like, I get all of that. What I'm saying is I would think that now you would tap back into it just because this is the trip. Uh, this no, is it's the not. trip. Uh, it's not though. See, it's it's not me making a comeback. What it is is I just want it. so it's one thing for me to go put on a wetsuit and go with Mark out to ride some 8th Street Manhattan Beach funky beach break that I've been surfing since I was 14, right? It's fun. I ride three waves, call it a you know, call it a day. Does it just I just want to I just want to prove to myself mostly that I can still do it. You know? But I thought, what I really want to do here is go somewhere where I don't know. I don't want to put a wetsuit on, and I want to ride a. I want to ride waves like we rode last time I was here, but on a reef where I can just do it for a week at a time. I just want to get into a groove. Easy. I don't want. I don't care what board I'm riding. If, okay. if, if I might end up riding a fucking soft top, I don't know what I'm going to ride. I just want to get out there and ride in tropical water and trim out, tuck my back knee in a little bit, so they know that I used to be good, you know, and. Ride down the line. That's it. So that they know I used to be good already indicates that you're tapping into it. <laughs> that's the but that's my big problem is that I still want to surf well. And even when I was out there I with know. you, I told you last time we that's went out there, I, I got my first wave that you saw me get, I was fine. And the second wave, what do I try to do? I'm going to try to hit the lip and then I fall off. So so will you paddle out at cloud break? Absolutely not. No, no not even just to check it out and to suss it out. Well, and- no, because see, that's that's more that's more humbling and humiliating to me. Again, because of this ego thing that I can't shed, I can't just pick it up and drop it. If I'm sitting in the boat at cloud break to watch Mark, my lifelong best friend, surf, I'm gonna I'm gonna just sit there and either I'm either gonna grind away in my head, like what, like, or I'm gonna just I'm gonna grind away until I pick my board up and go out and join. Hundred percent. I don't want to go <laughs> surf. I don't. I don't. The last thing I want to do at this really late stage is try to ride a pretty challenging left hand reef break you know i think on after the first two days of surfing swimming pools and getting your your uh, ego inflated getting my sea legs back just like you did on the second wave where you go try to hit the lip you'll paddle out or you'll take the boat out to cloud break you'll see him get an easy roll in and then pull into an almondy barrel and make it out and you'll go that's doable compared to what i was doing this last have you two served, days have you served cloud break no i've never been there it looks good. I, it, I mean, it, it looks all, unbelievably but, challenging. But the thing about Cloud Break that I don't like, and again, I've never surfed there, but what, what Mark, Mark surfed there a bunch of times, and he said, you know, it, it just sort of keeps going until you hit that, what is it called, shish kebab or something? Or something, I, something? Yeah, yeah. It just keeps going until you hit this one really scary part. And you, and if you're, if you're in, you know, if you, you kick out before that, and you're, but fuck, I, don't, I just want to ride a wave that puts me into a deep channel. I don't want to even think about riding a wave that puts me into a place called shish kebab. Fuck that, you know? I just want to ride a wave. I want to ride swimming pools. And I've, I've looked at pictures of swimming pools. And swimming pools, I think, goes right over sand at the end. Like swimming oh, pools really? is a reef. It goes. It's called swimming pools because the water is so clear. Why? Because it's over sand, you know? And that's what I feel like I need. Restaurants then? Not a chance. Really? And you know why? There was a, you know, I was, you know, I don't, I, it's a weird, like, it's a weird thing. Like, when I brag about how good I, I was, you know, into my 30s and 40s, what I was really good at was tube riding front side. I, I had a lot of, I, all my mechanics were really good. I couldn't do it in big ways because I was too scared, but I was, oh, let me get that phone. No, that's all right. Go for it. Manhattan number two time. Perfect distraction. That was a good thought. What, can you, it, was, could, it was about swimming pools, restaurants. Um, yeah. I was winding up for we something. Got, we got 
uh, interrupted by a phone call. And Can you trying, replay the last 10 seconds? Or is it no, too, no, it's don't worry way about too it. complicated. I turned my winger off, so anyway. Um, um, <laughs> we're going. Are we on right now? Yeah, we're on. Okay. We're, I never stopped it. Uh, Good. We, we were on, we went from swimming pools to restaurants to... It, was, it had something to do with me quitting, and but I didn't, I didn't actually quit. Kicking out at shish kebabs. Oh, I know what I was saying. Perfect. And it was just it was it was just a dumbass humble brag, which is the a, the, the 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 sort of asymmetry I had where I was a I I was a really good technical tube rider in um, small medium sized tubes, but right only. I mean, I could I had every I had a lesser version of everything that a pro could do. I wasn't as good as them, but I knew. I knew everything, every type of stall, every time of way, every little trick there was to get in the tube, I had it figured out. And backside, I was like a third year surfer. Oh, really? I could not do anything backside. So, you know, like it didn't, it, you know, so, so all the, like the time, the time I went to G land I, and I surfed the Watu. It was all wasted on me. I couldn't do, I couldn't, I can't ride the tube backside. I never could fit myself in there in a way that, you know, so. Um, I, was having, I was having that comfort. I surfed um, Palm Springs Surf Club last week, a, a week ago today. When did that open again? It's not open. Oh shit, really? I, yeah, I just got an invite. Who'd you go with? Um, you wouldn't know them, but it's uh, it was like an investors only day. And so I got an invite from a friend who's involved with the project. But we were having this exact conversation about uh, the backside tube riding. You either have it or you don't, you know? And you see certain people even like- You see really good surfers that aren't very good at it. Really well, like Sonny Garcia, for example, <clears throat> looks square when he's right, in the back, you right, know, in the right, tube backside. Right. And there's a lot of professional, I mean, world champ surfers like that, right. that just couldn't quite. They didn't look, they didn't look like, uh, like, like the really good ones just look like they're, they're, they're like almost like molten. Yeah, like, I think, think of Chris Ward, cause that's who I was watching right. when I was growing up. And he was completely, like you said, just, um, it was like a, he was like a yoga. Like, like a gum, like a Gumby. Like, total Gumby yoga right, guy, you right, know? And right. it was just, and more fitting to the shape of the wave yes. than he possibly could on his front hand. Right. You know? So some people either have that or they don't. Right. And um, so it's interesting to hear you. Well, I remember in that. the 70s, uh, Marvin Foster had that thing. It was like, yeah. And, and I remember, like, you know, at that point, I was so gung ho. I was going to learn how to do this and I was going to get good at it the way I did. I got good at everything I was going to do. And all I ever did was pull in and drop to into that, the Marvin Foster position. And hold it until it hit me off because I right. couldn't, I couldn't adjust. do that thing. I couldn't do that thing you're talking about, yeah. which is adjust. And somehow front side, I figured all that stuff out. Back side, I never could. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, there's rights. On well, that's all. I, so that's all. Yeah. I, and again, I was just so I was really pretty good going right and left. And uh, you know the, this weird, this this super weird irony about because you know I don't want to get into the whole wave pool thing, but I, you know Kelly's wave and Sir France to me is the existential. Like the end of surfing kind of right. thing, you know, doomsday. And the funny thing about that is that one other, the other video that if you scroll down on me long enough, you come to that shot of me at Surf Ranch getting in the tube sort of at Surf Ranch. That's my last, that's the last tube ride I'm ever going to get in my life. I mean, it's kind of funny. I, I no, it is. No, and, and I, I hate have, to tell listen, you no, no. the fact that Google says former writer, why I quit surfing and then you getting tubed in a, in a pool. I know. So anyway, there you go. That's where we're at. <laughs> Um, we were talking about celebrities. I, I, I got a bunch. I want to ask you, this is totally, we're on limited time now because mm -hmm. Austin's going to walk in the mm -hmm. door in the next 10 minutes. And I had so much that I wanted to ask you about. Pick the good ones. About your youth and Jay Adams and all that. But instead we're going to go superficial. We'll save that. Is for that later. your, uh, is that your thing for me? Is that your prep work right there? Yeah. See, this is why this is so good with you. And I, I just did a, I did a thing with some, with some people from uh, a German TV thing on surfing on big wave surfing and uh tons of money behind this I was like a, and, and and i i just had to t sit across from this guy who was just asking me questions because he just skimmed through history of surfing he goes uh tell me about the history of surfing <laughs> and then if and i i kind of stammered around he goes 
what are the five most important moments in the history of surfing? Oh my gosh. And you know, and 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 first of all, this ended up being like an eight hour thing at my house. And I put them off and they ended up flying with all of their stuff. The nice the four nicest German non-surfer guys you've ever yeah. met. Yeah. Couldn't be not couldn't have been nicer. Set up everything. And I just ended up getting really cranky because sure. because they're asking me these questions. Like this guy didn't they didn't none of them give a shit. None of them knew anything about surfing or cared about surfing. And they didn't do what you just did here, which is just yeah. thank you. Well, no, if, of course. I have quotes from magazine articles that you've written and all sorts of stuff that I wanted and, to get to. We're not, we're not say, even get close you know to what it. you know what's incredible about this? So it makes sense that we're gonna only probably touch on thirty percent of what you did because yeah. that's kind of almost how it should be. You want to write and I I don't I mean I have like this is just game recognized game. That's the way. That's exactly how it should be. When I used to do interviews, what you're doing, that's that's what you'd want to do. You'd want to make a bunch of questions. I, anyway, well, by the way, me, by the way, cheers to you for ten years. Thank you. I know, right? Jeez, man. Thank you. And I this is why. It. This is why when I tell people I'm going to do Search Blender for the fifth time, they go, "Are you kidding me? You Search Blender again?" Yeah. I say, "Yeah, again. man. Of course." David, well, Lee. one of the all-time favorite guests. So you're welcome back anytime. Next year. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I had a Jay Adams stuff, but we'll get to that later. But I also, I'll just tell you how these segments are broken down. Wild surf stories from your days at the magazine. I wanted to, you don't have to answer these, but right. I wanted to ask you about uh, the biggest celebrity hookup that you know about in the surf world, craziest drug bender that you're aware of, most extravagant expense, either from an individual or maybe a board brand, uh, brand as a marketing expense best surfing you've ever witnessed who's the biggest diva that you've encountered who had the most squandered talent or another segment that i had planned is have you ever and these are questions about you personally Do that because one, go. yeah i think this one because yeah here's the deal i'm trying to research you in preparation for today where i would normally go is eos.surf do my research there. Turns out there's no Matt Warshaw page on the EOS of Surf. So I this know. is my effort okay. to create the EOS of Surf equivalent page in the audio podcast platform. Let's try it. Let's Have see. you ever been punched in the face? Yep. So can I tell that story real quick? Do you want, do you want a story behind I it? Or just, a, or just a yes story. or no? Do you, are, I want the story. This isn't like we're doing a, like a fast thing. Okay. Podcasting requires a story. The story is that um, there was a guy who... Uh, there was a guy in Manhattan Beach who had just started being like sort of the known local drug dealer, a guy that I'd known for a long time. Cool guy. I'm not going to say his name. And uh, he came up to me. Or, okay, so let me back up. I had been, another friend of mine had said, hey, Matt, can you introduce me to that girl over there? And this was at a party in like 1980, house party. And I went over and I, talked to this girl and I said I have a friend who and I was just kind of sort of go between this whole thing right I spent some time talking to her and that was it and an hour later the friend of mine who the first friend of mine I was talking about the drug dealer came up to me and said hey Warshaw you were trying to hit on hitting hitting on my girl and I said no I would no 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 I wasn't get out of here man trying to do that and he said no, I heard you were trying to do that. And it became he became kind of belligerent and he backed off for a while. And I had some friends come up and say, fuck him, man. You know, get him outside. And if he does anything, we'll jump, we'll jump him. And so the guy came back to me and he said, I'm gonna ask you again, were you hitting? And I said, I was not. And he and and uh the point is we ended up outside and <laughs> Did you try to like puff up your chest and actually like do it because your buddies told you to? I'm just sitting there. I'm, I'm just sitting there. Uh, I didn't puff up my chest, but I was so sure that there was not going to be anything that was going to get too weird. And next thing I know, literally like before I had time to think, I've been hit straight in the, I've been punched straight in the mouth. My glasses have flown off to the left. My jaws flown off to the right. And nobody's fucking made a move whatsoever. <laughs> So I picked my glasses up, and this guy has done what he, he did to do. He's hit. He's defended his. He's defended his woman, and I'm just sitting there with a bleeding lip, and I'm kind of looking around. You know, I mean, no one's even there it's anymore. Shocking. They were just gone. No one jumped in. You know, and the very next weekend, I saw this guy, and he said, "Hey, 
I am so sorry. I know that what I, I taught you, he talked to his girlfriend, and what I'd been saying was that somebody else, I'm so sorry. Can I set you up in the bathroom? You know? And I said, sure, man, <laughs> sounds great. So we go in and he just, you know, sets me up. And for five years after that, every time he's, Warshaw, Warshaw, come here, come here, come here. Wow. And so, you know, for a punch in the mouth, Every time I saw him at a party, super nice guy, by the way. He he did this, you know. I don't know. He just I don't know why he did. I don't know why he decided to hit me in the first. You know, you, turns out drug dealers aren't exactly the most level-headed people. I think. Not the most level-headed people, but he but he he obviously had a conscience and he knew and, a and he felt drug dealer and he knew? felt that he really knew he'd done me wrong and he had he yeah, he'd, yeah. he'd split my lip open. So but, I got. But to be honest, not that wrong because you took the punch. I mean, you didn't get KO'd. You didn't break a jaw. Like you didn't break it. a jaw. I just picked up my you didn't glass. Go down. I picked up my. I probably went down. Okay, <laughs> you left that out. You know, I probably. I mean, I probably went down, but I got up, put my glasses on, and he was just sort of standing there. I wasn't gonna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't gonna rush him or anything. Yeah. So yeah, I've been hit. I've been hit in the face. Um, and I, and looking back, I feel like. I'd do it again. Like I feel, I felt like I got the better of that deal, all things considered. Well, that I don't need to ask my second question about illicit drugs. Then I quit. <laughs> I just, I, yeah, no. I <laughs> uh, have you ever punched anybody in the face? I wasn't going to ask it, but now never. I'm no. to. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Yeah, you don't seem like the type. Uh, have you ever stolen anything? Yeah, I used to. Um, I used to steal a tiger's milk. Bar. Are those even things anymore? Is that still a thing? I don't know, but they were a thing when I was growing up. You know, you know what they are? I know what they are, yeah. Delicious. Bro. I used to steal a Tiger's Milk bar every morning from this local store that I would go in and visit. And But it was, I would go in and buy a bunch of other stuff and just steal the Tiger's Milk bar. This is when I was probably 19 or something. Why would you, you had the money to buy a bunch of things. Why would you steal that? I, did I steal one every day? That I, I might be like, I was talking to somebody recently saying about how never trust I never trust anyone whose memories are this. Like, maybe I stole, I don't know if I, I didn't do it every day. I used to steal a lot of Tiger's Milk bars. because You know why I stole them? Because remember how much a candy, well, you don't remember this, but in, in, in um, when were you born? <laughs> the year you were winning events, uh, 81. So in 81, this is when this was happening, you know, a candy bar was a quarter, but a Tiger's Milk bar was like a buck. Oh, okay. And I and I and candy bars were bad for me because you know Tiger's Milk bars back then people thought were healthy, <laughs> right? That's what we are. This is a health bar, and I go fuck. I don't want the candy bar. I want the Tiger's Milk bar, and I would just pocket it. But I bet I would buy other stuff because I felt bad about it. And I felt I, I you know I no I was never much of a thief. I felt I feel bad about it even say, I, I'm laughing about it now. I feel like an asshole for doing that. It's interesting though, right? Like there's a human impulse to test the boundaries, maybe, and like steal because I'm I haven't stolen anything that i can remember in you know my adult life but when i was a kid i did did you do it because you were trying to impress friends do you think no <laughs> it was me and my cousins were a little group of you know four you were trying to impress your cousins well then. i was no i don't think i was trying to impress them we wanted hot wheels and we didn't have the money for hot wheels mm. but our parents would have bought us the hot wheels if we asked you know what i mean like it's more but, of a prove yourself thing was it or i it's a great question that i'm trying to get to the bottom of right now just Right, I right. think it was just you're was pushing like, the boundaries of what you think you can get away it's with. Exciting. Or what, yeah, there's an excitement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would go to a Target, not that far from here, and yeah, stick them down our pants. Basically, how like, old were you? I I, just, I don't know. Like ten. Ten. Yeah. You know, and got away with it. Never once got caught, but developed a guilt at some point from getting away with it. Right. Like right. not only didn't get caught by the authorities, never got caught by our parents. Right. You're the same as me, but you, so you quit on your own. Yeah. Like you, felt guilt. Even, I don't even think we did it for years. I think we did it maybe for a month or two in a summer, you know, and got away with it and felt a certain amount of guilt to where I still feel the guilt now. Right. So me too, but <laughs> me too. I agree with that. It's crazy. Yeah. Interesting though. Um, have you ever had sex on the beach? Yep. Not from my own choice, but I had, um, I had, I had one girlfriend who just had a um, thing for sort of semi-public, and you know I was, I was, tw I was twenty-six or seven or something, and you know, 
I'd go with anything. You know, she wanted it. it so our, so at, at the bottom, at the base of T Street, there's a, God, this is, I don't, you know, I'm going to try to tell this. At the base of T Street, there's a, a, a picnic bench, a picnic table. And she decided that was going to be a, our place for the, you know, and it was late at night, but it was, and there was nobody around, but it was public. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit more, um, less sand involved if you're on a picnic bench. Yeah. Cause I mean, when I was growing up, sex, it, it, there's famous sex scenes in movies, right? Where you're rolling around in the surf. And so now being so heavily involved in surfing, that seems like a, uh, those things would be connected, but I've never had sex on the beach. And furthermore, I would turn it down. No, because like, like so the, the pina colada song where it's like, right. If you like, if you like making love in the sand dunes of the Cape or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, no, no one likes making love in the sand dunes of the Cape. Right. It's fucking Sandy. You exactly. know, like they get back to the room. And so the picnic bench is the ultimate. This is the solve. bench made, the bench made sense. The and again, I, I, this was not like, it was, it was not my thing. It, it was hers, but I, I, you know, I was happy to go along with it. Yeah, well, the sand might affect her more than it would affect you, actually. Right, right. So it's a bad decision on her part. <laughs> but the picnic bench, ultimate solve. You got it figured out. Yeah, it made sense. Yeah. Uh, you ever lied on your taxes? No, um, I had somebody, I had somebody uh, when, not only that, um, I'm such a socialist. <laughs> I am. I, you know, not only have I not lied to my taxes, but I had somebody during COVID say to me about um, Encyclopedia of Surfing, hey, man, you can. there's a lot of free money to be had from the government right now for small businesses. And I, you know, when, the, when that all happened, the, biz, the, the government sent me a, uh, a form that I filled out, and has your business been hurt by COVID? And I said no, because it, if anything, you know, EOS may have had a slight uptick you know, surfing was popular, and I just me and three part-time people. It might have only been two part-time people at that point, but you know, I just there was there was, I don't know, fifty grand or something there there to be that they're willing to give to you. And I didn't want to. I didn't take it. And they probably, I mean, I don't know what program that was, but some of that they weren't even asking for back. Absolutely, it was just no, that's, free that's the point. And I, I didn't know. I didn't want to take it. Wow. I, and I don't feel bad about that at all. It just seemed like it was that that literally to me feels like stealing every even though and I made this protest to the person who was suggesting it to me he said everyone else is doing it and I said I, I know I know but I can't I, I just I couldn't I couldn't do it well that's a great segue to promote eos.surf are you doing a fun drive this year yeah what month December okay cool how did it go last year by the way it went really well okay. it went and um I mean it's a fun, it's a funny, and I'm still, I'm still trying to here, you know, take this. I'm still trying to figure out what the business model is, right? Because anybody who's doing what I'm doing is trying to figure out the business model. All these years later, EOS has been going for ten years, and at, t at the end of ten years, I'm making fifty grand a year still, right? It's nothing. It's less. Is that what you started at? Uh, it's, it's a little more than I. It's less than I was making three years in, you know. So, but. I mean, it's not, it's just, and it's just, uh, I don't know, I, I, it, it's, a, it's a hard circle to square. I will not put ads on the thing. I don't, I, I, every time I go on Beach Grid, as much as I love that site, like, it just drives me insane. A huge part of EOS, right from the beginning, like, part of what makes me happy to do it, is it the way the site looks? In 2.0, the, the new site's going to go up in, <laughs> I don't know, three. Don't say, three or four weeks. I don't, don't know. say it out loud. Uh, when the new site goes up, it's going to be even better. But even the old site to me still looks like I'm still happy to. I'm I'm, the, I'm I'm inspired to work on it every day because I still like the way it looks. And I don't think I'd feel that way about it if every time you open the site, you've got to click off ads. You know, so it was always built. It was built into the site that it wouldn't have no ads. So it's it is 100 subscriber and donor supported right and that's how, that's hard to do it's hard to ask people for for money for something when there's so much free stuff yeah because a lot of people don't care if you have to click through the ads and everything and there's a but, way to elegantly incorporate ads it's not just ugly or nothing so i see i just i disagree i just think that there's no more you know you can well okay and i'm not i'm not arguing that you should have advertising but i think that um it's well worth everybody who's interested in surfing it's well worth investing in 
eos.surf right. and paying the membership because I collect, I, you know, publish podcast interviews every week and I often utilize it for my Sorry, research. I want to back, I want to back off because okay. I want to say if I had a podcast, I would have ads all, I, yeah, yeah. I, I would have ads in that. Oh no. What, yeah. I, what I, what I, what I don't like is the things like on beach grit where the, the things pop up on the screen, yeah. like the ads that you have and the ads that pod save America has. And I, you know, I get that. And I would do that. If I had a podcast, man, I would do it just the way you do it. I would go out and get the ads. And that's exactly what I would do. But for your business, what I'm recommending to people is um, there's no one place to find surf history. And if you, if you're, if you Google let any given name in the surf world, and you want to learn about that person, the information might be dispersed across the internet. It's not verified. It's not vetted. Um, the reality is most of it actually isn't on the internet. Right, it's in right. people's garages, right. in magazines right. that are in a box somewhere. And so to have somebody at least attempting to catalog it all and have it in That's one right. location right. is super valuable. And is the cost still $3? Yeah, and I think also too, like <laughs> it is. It's going up to five soon. Okay, good. Because that I think was the a thing, conversation. To, we had to last me, week. like the, the 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 selling point is like I actually think the Sunday Joint has become the Sunday Joint has become this like flagship of of e, of EOS. So the thing that I send out every Sunday, this newsletter, which is like the the reason I my ears perked up a little bit at calling me a former writer. My writing, yeah, has never actually been better than it is at this age doing this throwaway the sunday joint is a throwaway it's meant to be a throwaway but it's a good throwaway you know it's a thousand words and you get this email if you're a, an eos subscriber called the sunday joint let me just say but people like assume that the joint means i'm talking about weed this whole point about naming it the sunday joint was that it's sunday and it's not i'm happy to have it be weed as well but the Sunday joint was also supposed to meant, be meant like a joint where you meet, like a juke joint, like a place where people meet and just talk. And more like a, 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 an English, uh, a Sunday joint meant the place that you went to after church was you would go to somebody's house and they would, they would put a, uh, um, you know, a, an animal of some kind, I, I guess. A, a roast. A roast. And you're having this giant joint that everyone's gnawing on and cutting up and so it was this meal that everyone had together. That's that was the actual. That's the real what what the Sunday joint means. And if you want to talk, if it's, if it's weed, if it's the juke joint, if it's all good. But the Sunday joint is the thing that maybe of all the things I've done in my whole career is kind of combining everything. And mm. and and so there's like this. I make this say, hey man, support EOS because support surf history. That's and that's great. People will some people will do that, but but give me five bucks a month and let me and, and get this joint, get this thing sent to your inbox every. And, and I, you're gonna like it. It's a fun. Yeah. It's a really fun read, and it's gonna uh, it's gonna be your gateway to a whole bunch of stuff that you will read throughout the week or throughout the day at least. Right. You know. And so I don't want people to. I, I'm happy to get money because of support surf history. I'd rather have people say, oh my God, you know, I'd, I'd pay five bucks to get the joint four times a month. That's, I'm stoked on that. And that's, and the people that love the joint really love the joint. I've got people who, you know, and so that's the, you know, it's sort of a tooth. It's like, you know, help me uh, preserve his surf history, but also, you know, pay for this, thing that you won't get anywhere else. Yeah, there's something in the archive, but there what you're inspired by is kind of having something to do <clears throat> forward moving. And, and and the joint the joint's a funny thing in that it's like it's me speaking to everybody here from 2023 and it's a lot of it is about topics that are right now, but it's always going to like and, and again like to to sort of consolidate everything. Surf history for me is interesting when it bounces back from then to now. And I can you know, I can do that. I do that, and I do that really well in the joint. Where if I'm talking about surfing in the 20s or surfing during the Depression, I can usually bounce it off something that's happening now. And when and when you get the when you get it going back and forth like that, it kind of creates a almost like a sort of a, a, a tonal thing that sure. just makes for me anyway. It makes like that, that's why I surf. I surf because. It's been great. It's great now, and it's been great forever, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that, by the way, that's why I get so unsure on my footing when it's wave pools, because wave pools take that away. Dude. 
the, you know, the, the, the reason why I love surfing still is because of how difficult it is, but how, how, how much effort it takes to get those few, few seconds that are worth it. And that's the same way as it, as it was for, you know, surfers in the depression, surfers in, you know, in ancient Polynesia, like, you know, it's been the same for a long time. And that, and that, to me, that's a re- that it resonates in a way that I think um, makes sense. You know, another. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, the weekly commitment of it. Like, because when I look back at ten years of doing the podcast, I would not have uh, continued doing it if it wasn't for a certain obligation that I felt to the listenership. Right. Right. Because everything else in my life, it's easy to either quit the job and move on to the next thing right, or right, just walk right. away, whatever, throw in the towel. But because I felt this certain obligation to listenership and um, I now have 10 years to look back on, I'm grateful to the listenership to right. holding me accountable a- absolutely. to do the thing right. because it's a discipline that I wouldn't have had on my own. Yep. And that discipline has Dude. yielded a dimension in my kind of appreciation for surfing, but also a dimension in my own just work ethic that I wouldn't I bet, have had on my I own. bet you if I'd come in five years ago, you wouldn't be, you'd be prepared, but not that level of prepared. Right. Like I think I, I watched, I've watched you do this through how many years have we done podcasts. And every time we do this, you're better at it, you know? And I would like to think that I am too. You, you, yeah, yeah. you, you grow into the, you grow totally. into the job and you grow into the job partly because of the feedback you're getting from, the very audience, much, very right? Very much so. And a lot and, of people would shy away from it. So there was cert, a certain part about me that wanted to do the work that I will take credit for. But so much of it was just, uh, I I have dodged a bunch of other obligations in my life too. And I'm grateful that this was what, one that I committed to. What have you know? dodged? I mean, you're a, you're a good father and a good husband. I mean, you, yeah, but I'm 42. So everything fine. up until then. Dude, I didn't have my first kid till I was 49. I know, but a lot of people started in their twenties and thirties. So you're 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 good. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate and that. I also, and I also was thinking about you recently because the person of all my subscribers who keeps in touch, the person who every time I send him the automated three dollar a month billing for his subscription gets back to me to say thank you, which is I mean he's, he's saying thank you to an automated thing, which is is Tom Parrish, and he's. One of the, you know, you, he was one of your early. Yeah, one episode of your, three, I think. Yeah, so Tom Parrish is a treasure, right? And, and you and I, this is like almost a connection between my 10-year journey and your 10-year journey, is that we together have helped keep, I, I hope, you know, Tom Parrish doesn't go, like I'm going to board show, the, the boardroom show next Saturday, and you're going to go to boardroom show, and he would, he would rather walk over glass than go to one of those, right? But what, you know, he, he, who he was and what he was in surfing in, uh, from, you know, 72 to 76 or seven, I think is almost beyond the, comp, you know, beyond the scope of anything, anybody apart from Dick Brewer almost. Like Tom Parrish was, um, you know, the top of the mountain mm. for five years or something. And you talk to him all about that, and you know, you know, and, and he's and he's a straight shooter, and he was he made incredible boards, and he made boards that were mostly specific for the North Shore. Yeah, but you know, he did that thing beautifully, and he did it with great good humor, and and he was he was an easy guy to work with, and uh, still making boards on Maui, and I think, I think so in, in France he goes to yeah, France that's right, he's in France right now. Um, it's. I haven't, I haven't thought about that connection, but I'll re- pull the curtain back for listeners. When I first started doing the podcast over 10 years ago, I was like, man, how do I amplify this message out? Because nobody even knew what a podcast was. Tom Parrish did, certainly didn't know what no. a podcast was, right? I just reached out to him. I was in Hawaii. I was in on Oahu, and I wanted, for whatever reason, I don't even remember, I wanted to connect with Tom Parrish, and he was on Maui. So I messaged him. I emailed him. I think I found his email address or something. I was like, hey, dude, I'm doing these interviews. I probably said the word podcast and I maybe had to explain to him what it was. And I would love to fly over and interview you. And he was super gracious. And he's like, yeah, come on over. So I took a flight over just to interview him. Well, he's got a lot to say. And, and a lot of what he has to say is a little bit contrary to what surf history is. So I think that he looks forward to people maybe like so. He looks forward to people like you 
giving him an opportunity to say sort of say what he I see I thought that he would just not reply I thought that he'd been asked to be interviewed a million times and so he just this is what i'm saying he's a legend and he's just being forgotten because he doesn't play this game he doesn't go to the shows he and 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 because he chooses not to play the game does that mean he shouldn't be honored no it doesn't right you know yeah interesting well so do you know charlie smith yes holly eva surfer yes yeah oh yeah shaper so charlie smith i think tom has a place on charlie's property maybe or vice versa. So anyways, Charlie picks me up at the airport, takes me out. I interviewed Tom, takes me back to the airport, and I flew out same day. Just right. flew in just for that interview. And um, But I was like, man, how do I amplify this message? Because nobody knows what a podcast is. So I email Surfer Magazine, and I'm like, are you guys interested in writing like a transcribed version of this? And pro- That's where I saw it. it. That's where I saw it. In print yeah, yeah, or yeah. On, on the website right. maybe. And then I reached, I feel like maybe I Facebook messaged you and was like, hey, you have a listing for Tom Parrish on encyclopediaofsurfing.com at the time mm-hmm. before EOS. Right, right. And so just in the little sidebar where you reference source material, it, you can reference this if you'd like. Did I do that? Yeah, you did. Yeah, nice. Good. And you replied and you're like, absolutely, that'd be amazing. And maybe you listened to it and you said right, it was worth right, right, whatever. Right. So then you linked that in the reference column and I was like, sweet that was right. a real feather in my right. cap at the right. time you know so that's us that's that's that's, a, that's, a, that's what we do yeah you know yeah. and i think so you know i don't we're not curing cancer here you and i david <laughs> but i think we're serving a purpose right we're we're we're, we're not wasting our time either that's what i'm saying no i'm creating, stoked you're doing it i feel like we're i in all sincerity i feel like we're creating a certain amount of archival stuff for posterity and then we're also creating entertainment ephemera for this week. I think that's right. And the other thing is that um, there's something about this that feels uh, um, sort of true to what surf media was when it was when it was John Severson. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, it's so it still feels. What am I trying to say? I don't want to be like it's non corporate. We're just you're doing this thing out of pretty much out of your house here, right? I mean, hundred percent, yeah. And I do my thing in my guest room. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It it feels it feels good. I, I don't think there's going to be a lot more of us. I hope there are. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Is there going to be anyone else coming up doing this? How? Um, so, interestingly, the fact that Felipe Pomar reached out to me on because he saw something on YouTube was an eye opener for me. Because. YouTube is just a far broader ranging platform. Their algorithm is more sophisticated the way they feed information than podcasting. So I don't know if he's ever listened to a podcast. So was the YouTube thing just a short little snippet yeah. of our thing? It wasn't like a, it wasn't the whole thing. It was just So a- I published um, the full episode as a video and then a couple of little snippets that were more attention grabbing. Right. I basically borrowed Joe Rogan's uh, playbook. Listen, let me just say, one of the reasons why you and I are good at what we do is not that, that we're incredibly, I think, creative or talented. You do the same thing I do, which is you look at who's doing it yeah. right and say, well, let's, let's, let's sort of copy that. Yeah. And I, I, I can't, I, it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to express like how obvious that seems to me. Like somebody was asking me today at my shack interview was saying, like, how do you learn how to surf? And I said, I'm kind of down on this whole thing about, not down on exactly, but I kind of roll my eyes a little bit about like surf camps where you go and they have a whole 12 point system on how to learn how to surf. And I said, the way to surf is you go out and for as many hours as you can expend on it. And hopefully you're 10 years old and you've got a whole summer. And all you do is surf, 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 and watch the person who's a little bit better than you are or the lot bit better than you are. You surf and watch them and That's surf it. and watch them. And that's like my whole life, surf, music, uh, work, career, website. It's all about figuring out who does this the way I want to do it and how close can I get to that. Yeah. And so well, you, you, you tell me that that's how Joe Rogan, of course, to so do that. So Joe Rogan has these three-hour episodes that he does multiple times a week. And then some you, smaller ones. You couldn't possibly 
I mean, maybe devote fans who are mail carriers who are listening right, to right. something eight hours a day. Right. Maybe they can cover all the content. I certainly don't. But he then publishes on YouTube little snippets um, that are attention grabbing. So I'll pull so up. So how long? Like five minutes? Or? Yeah. Five, eight yeah. minutes. Yeah, 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 like, three yeah. minutes. Right, eight right, minutes. Right. Something like that. So I'll pull up YouTube and it feeds me Joe Rogan talking about psychedelics with Robert, you know, or whoever. Uh, Robert, Robert Downey Jr., whatever it is. I'm like, oh, interesting. So I'll like watch eight minutes of that and then I go, huh, now I want to listen to that episode and I'll go back and I'll listen to the episode when I'm driving home. Right. So that's what I've been doing. What so, about Instagram? Is that a, a shorter version even so yet? So then it's a one minute version on Instagram again. Right. So yes. But so do you do the, all that yourself? No, do you I have, slice a, it all I have down? a video editor who's doing it now. I used to do everything by myself, but I have a video editor working freelance that I send the files to and they... Uh, make the creative decisions right. on which are the salient points of conversation right. that would have right. relevance on YouTube versus right. uh, Instagram, right. you know? Right. And here's a clip for there and here's a clip for And there. every platform has its own. Yeah. And podcasting long is better. So like on the actual podcast itself, the audio thing, three hours works. Oh shit. <laughs> so what are we, what are we at now? Like one hour and 37 minutes. My mom just texted and said they're out front. <laughs> Oh, so we just so you so we're sitting having we're having a podcast right now and we're keeping your your mother and your son yes. out there in the hot sun. Apparently, just, I don't know. All right, I shit. didn't read the actual message. Uh, <laughs> hold on. She said, "I think she's actually at home still." All I think right, we're good. All right, all right. Um, so, but to your point of like, where does it go from here? Less money is better. As a what do you a, mean? A listener DM'd a week or two ago, and they were like, "Man, their analogy was more to do with the the uh, there's too many professional surfers." And back in the day when things were less professional, you right. had these really interesting personalities that would develop because you had to re- you had to rely on personality. That was how you that well, was how you you worked as a a bricklayer or a mason or whatever it was. But what I'm saying is, 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 is your, your personality was how you, you were. F- that came so, second. So you worked as a bricklayer or a mason and that developed a personality and you were really into surfing. And so then once you developed your surfing, it was a reflection of who you were as a human being, which was totally divergent from the next profession and surfer. Right. And you got good enough and proficient enough that you became elite status right and so then the profession came into it and it re- was a reflection of you right at a certain point money got involved and we'll fast forward to now where you're being paid six figures at the age of 13 right and so you have handlers and everything becomes there's nothing interesting about that it's all flat it's it just, all becomes flat and homogeneous that's at the right. age of 16 that's right and so everything starts to look the same and then when you get to the world tour level championship tour level uh, it's all looks the same. There's, there's, and if you are Dane Reynolds, you almost, you don't fit the mold. You don't get scored for what you're trying to do. And so you go, F it, I'm out of here. I'm going to go do my own thing, you know? And so that's where we're at today. And so the answer, or to draw it back to what we're talking about with media is I think it's better when YouTube comes along, you know, there's, five big magazines, let's say a few years ago, and everything starts to look the same and it's all kind of runs through the same few advertisers. It all starts to look too homogeneous. Once now we're on YouTube, it's like Ben Gravy. I don't relate to at all, but, but he, he is a huge following of people who think that he is. And he is, is he, there's no other Ben Gravy. Like no, he, like, like, exactly. Right. And then there's Koa Rothman. Right. Who's as core as you could be. I know. And he has a smaller following, but he has a significant following, you know? And Nathan Florence, North, yeah. who's equally as core, but he has his own thing that he's right. doing. Right. And so you have all of these little individual paths that you can enter the space with and get involved in and all that sort of stuff. It and feels a little bit throwback. It feels a little, little bit more like what it was. I agree. It right. does. It does. And so I think it's, uh, again, Am I why am I optimistic? It's part of that stuff. And right. those people... Those people actually turn out they are making money. So I shouldn't say that money is the common denominator because they're actually making money, but they are making it on their own terms. Right. So I feel good about it. Got to start including vloggers on EOS. Yeah, no, I should. I know. No, so one of the things, by the way, and I, I, don't, I know I don't mean this, 
it's got to be encyclopedia of surf, of 20th century serving because I can't take on this. Like, I can't actually, I can't do what I, I can't take this century on. It's, when when EO when the, when the book came out, it happened to be right at the turn of the century, more or less. 2003. So, yeah, but but it was written in 2001 and two. And okay. Everything from 2003 forward is pretty hit or miss. Yeah. Everything before that's really solid. Yeah. Anyway. Well. Anyway, anyways, are we uh, we're yeah, good. We're good. EOS dot surf. Anything else to say? No, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I came by here. It's a lovely day outside. I've got uh, one and a half Manhattans in me. I didn't eat a picante pepper yet. You will. I know you never eat while we're talking, but you should shovel some food in before you drive home. And don't let him fool you. It was two Manhattans. It wasn't one and a half. It was two. And you know what else about that is that uh, my Manhattan ratio, you know this, right? I told you before, is is uh, the standard Manhattan ratio is, is two to one. Yeah. Bourbon to... Yeah. Vermouth, and mine is three to two. So, oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? Can you can yeah. you do the math? Yeah. I'm, so I did two to one. So your second one wasn't as. All right. So that's that's okay. 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 What, what I'm saying is like. Uh, anyway, we've okay. got. I, I don't know. Like, how many more years until we've actually f- gotten through all of the different Manhattan stuff that we need to get through to, before we feel like we're. I think I think you will move off of the Manhattan at a certain point. Never. How did you feel about the twist? Loved it. It okay. provided aromatics more than it provided palate. No, no, it's supposed to. Yeah. And will you do it again? Uh, if I have citrus handy, I will do it again. How do but you, I want to go You live in Orange for. County. How do you not have citrus? You'll always have citrus county. You're this right. Is, we we kind of do always have citrus Yeah, handy. I know. Yeah. I, no, I liked it. But again, it was more an aromatic thing than it was. Like, I didn't taste the but difference. Aromatic but aromatic counts for a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you were telling you're going to tell me that I'm going to end up drinking martinis because I won't, I won't, I promise you. I may go, I may go at some point to a Negroni. Or I'm not an trying old, to predict an old fashioned, perhaps. But so I, that's adjacent to the Mar- Manhattan. I, but it, I'm, I'm not trying to predict what the cocktail will be. I'm just saying, after if we do this for enough years, maybe decades, here's the thing: we'll end up on a different cocktail than we started with. We will not, and, I, and here's why. What, what's going to, what's going to keep us, the thread that'll keep us the, 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 the through line. The Manhattan. Will be that no matter what happens in our lives, lives, deaths, divorce, uh, it doesn't matter what happens. We always have a Manhattan. Okay, things got morbid there. So, but I like it because um, I was thinking about this in relation to today's five year, whatever it is that we've been doing this. Is I have a group of friends that have been getting together for. 15 years now that we started as a wine kind of we're all into wine and so that's how we connected but we've been getting together every six weeks or so eight weeks maybe uh for 15 years now and when you track that 15 years it is exactly what you said there's been deaths there's been right 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 uh children there's been marriages there's been divorces there's been bankruptcies there's been every version of life right and it's like just committing to the consistency of doing that is a certain uh, absolutely security and comfort that you can just be yourself well, it's kind of all we have it you is. know if you think about it yeah so um it makes everything else worth it uh yeah. but back to the cocktail of the night what i'm telling you is palm springs i was like man exhausted from the day where do i go get dinner tonight so i google i'm like i don't want a hamburger like I'm exhausted. A hamburger would be the most comfort. You're shaking your head now. No, you're saying I'm saying hell yes. Hell yes. Okay, yeah, hell that's yes. right. So this place pops up. It's called the Hay Day, and it's pitches itself as martinis and hamburgers. They're like it doesn't seem like a pairing. It's the perfect pairing. Let me tell you. Well, okay. I, I'm not going to just. I'm not. I'm not going to fall into agreement. I'm going to say okay, it worked for you. I'm glad. It but was I, amazing. I, I can't imagine eating a hamburger with anything except for a beer. I can't. Im- Red wine. No, no. See, if I a, a cocktail demands to a cocktail for me means you're not eating anything with it. Like I don't. This is part of why I didn't. Because mm. I just want to focus on the cocktail. Mm. A beer, you know, I'm I'm all over the place. Okay. A glass of wine, maybe too. But okay. No, the cocktail, no. Well. For anybody who ends up in Palm Springs serving a wave pool, the heyday. This got shaggy at the end here. We got got a little shaggy. All right, whatever. I'm comfortable with it. All right, eos.surf. That's it. Until next year. Surfsplendor.com. Thank you.
I appreciate that. Until next year. And you know what? Mm. In 10 years, we'll be doing the same podcast talking about our 20-year anniversary. Imagine that. No, I, it's there. It's, it's going to happen. So I will be 62. I'll be 63. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of taking bathroom breaks, we'll have a catheter hooked up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's some some advantages to all that. Yeah, I like it. I like the idea of a diaper. A lot of, it's a lot easier. <laughs> My kids will be taking care of me. Thanks, David Lee. All right. See ya. All right.